Los Angeles is my city. I mean, sometimes I wonder how it all began. People started coming over and settling here as early as 9,000 years ago. Wow, it's hard to imagine, but did you know that where we are now was once open land? If you walked from downtown to the coast, you'd pass by springs, lakes, dry lakes, which would fill up after a rain, and clumps of willow trees. The LA River would pass through this area on its way to the Pacific Ocean. LA isn't known for lots of rain, but back then, the old newspapers told stories of storms that flooded and damaged the city. It was actually really dangerous, and people were injured or even killed by the fast-moving water. The river would change direction all the time and go anywhere from Santa Monica to San Pedro, just searching for the ocean. I can't even imagine what it would be like to build a city around a river that keeps changing. I mean, it really must be dangerous. That's exactly what the people from Los Angeles thought. So, in 1914, the banks of the river were channeled or covered in concrete. When this was done, the river was sent south to the ocean in what is now San Pedro. What was left in this area was a lake, a meandering creek, and a lagoon. The area became known as a marshland or a wetland because at certain times of the year, the water would saturate the soil. People thought it would be great land for farming, and the plants that grew around here would clean the water and also prevent the land from eroding. It looked pretty exotic, so the entertainment industry would come and use the area for filming nature scenes. And did you know that it used to be an amusement park? And it was built in the 1940s and was called Hoppyland, named after Hopalong Casting. And they had rides that were on the water and off, but they had to close it down in 1954 because it became a public beach. You know, it's a bit ironic that, that cities throughout history have generally been placed next to harbors, and rivers and wetlands because of the food and natural resources they provide. And yet in modern city settings, we don't actually use those resources as we did historically. We use them primarily for recreation and for the ecosystem services they provide. So all of the decisions in a place like Marina del Rey are negotiated. If you were asked to build a marina, where would you even start? I know it's a bit overwhelming, but what problems would you have to solve? What would you like it to look like? And who would you build it for? Dr. Strauss talked about ecosystem services, so we'd have to know what we'd want from the marina and what we have to work with. There's got to be a bunch of engineering involved. I read that in the 1920s, the Venice canals were built to make the area look like Venice, Italy. Cottages lined the shore, and people rode in gondolas across the shallow waterways, but the water didn't flow very well. And then, in 1929, oil was discovered. So oil derricks sprang up along Santa Monica, all the way down to Playa del Rey. But within a few years, the fields along the coast started drying up, and what was left was an oily residue that attracted mosquitoes. Finally, in 1954, President Eisenhower was convinced to sign a law that would authorize the harbor as a federal project. You know that getting permission is only the first step in a very, very long process. Now it's up to the engineers, the architects, and the designers to get to work. The engineers made all kinds of plans. They had to think about the land they had to work with, the structures that were already nearby, and how they were going to get the water into the marina, move around, and then flow out again. Since boats were going to use it, the engineers had to think about where to put them. Boats use the wind, so the position of their slips or where they park is really important in making sure that they can get in and out of the marina safely. That's a lot of math, science, and engineering. Once all the planning decisions were made, then they had to start planning the construction. You know, like where to put the dirt they dug up so that the water doesn't get through before the engineers get to it. Oh, all of this planning is making my head hurt. Just months after the marina first opened, 
big waves from a far off storm hit the harbor and these swells damaged boats and docks. It even pulled the seawall out into the ocean. But that doesn't happen now, does it? No. The engineers built a model of the marina and they ran experiments with it to figure out what they had to do. And these models are so cool. They look exactly like the real marina and they have structures like jetties that the engineers could move around and run water through to see what would happen. So using these models, they figured out that if they built a breakwater, these rocks would deflect waves and protect the marina. And they built an actual one that still stands today, protecting the marina from heavy weather events. Now that we've got the marina, the next project is to combine Baldwin Hills and Kenneth Han through bike paths and walkways that lead to the ocean. That's where the planners and developers come in. They're the ones who figure out where to put the services for the boaters, places to live, restaurants, and other businesses. They also have to decide what types of buildings and styles they want, and what plants to use for landscaping. If I were to build my own marina, I'd want it to look like a tropical paradise, mm -hmm. like going to the South Pacific. <laughs> yeah, but you're not alone on that one. <laughs> the planners created that. A lot of the streets in Marina del Rey are named after islands, and the palm trees are used to create that island feel. Landscaping and building choices we make have big impacts on the animals that live here too. Marina del Rey is extraordinary in that it is still affiliated with a natural marsh system. It's affiliated with dunes that have been restored. There are still endangered species that nest and make their homes here. And so while this is clearly an urban harbor and it's dominated by the boats on the surface, both above and below, it's teeming as uh, a very vibrant ecosystem. This part of California is actually in an area called a biodiversity hotspot, recognized by Conservation International as one of a handful of really, really important ecosystems that have lots of plants and animals that are only found in this area. In fact, by some estimates, half of the plants in this part of Southern California are only found here. And so their role is important not only to the local ecosystem, but to the global genetic reserve that we have in biodiversity. I read that palm trees aren't native to this area. Doesn't it create problems if plants are brought in from outside ecosystems? Whatever plants you choose attracts certain animals. In the early days, plants were chosen for that island feel or simply because they were available. So the eucalyptus trees that were planted grew tall and created homes for birds to nest in. So what you're saying is that for every choice we make, there's consequences. The first shrubs that were planted here attracted feral cats, rats, and other pests. And the wooden structures that were built brought termites. So if we were going to build a marina, the plants we would use and the resources we would need could affect the animals that come here. There's more to it than that. As the climate changes, we have to select plants that will survive in the climate that's to come. So, as we plant trees, we have to think decades into the future. If the community gets involved, they'll become more informed about the issues. Mm -hmm. Some people even volunteer to help gather information that will be used in the policy decisions. A community scientist is just a normal stakeholder who gets involved in a local issue and helps collect data that informs that issue and then in turn informs the policy that is developed as a result. There's been a lot of engagement meetings and events where community members are brought in to meet with the, the individuals who are putting together these changes and voice their concerns. And I've seen those concerns actually addressed and then put into the, the plans that are being developed for the marina.
So if we know what the people love about the marina and we understand how it's being used, we can make choices that'll improve these characteristics. So what do the people who use the marina say about it? The things that I like about Marina del Rey are it's a very, very, very small community of sailors and community members and lifeguards, coast guard persons that work together to celebrate sailing and the sailing community. So it's a wonderful place to be, it's a wonderful place to live, it's a wonderful place to work. The beauty of sailing in Marina del Rey and also teaching sailing in Marina del Rey is that the winds are pretty consistent. We can be in the harbor instructing and in our very safe little enclosed environment and then 15 minutes later we're out in the middle of the ocean. Now we're looking at Catalina, we're looking at the mountains, we see all of Southern California, it's fabulous. Once you leave this harbor you can go anywhere in the world. This is my home. This is where I leave from. This is where I come back to. But I can go anywhere I want in the world. We're in Marina del Rey right now. It's about 5.50 in the morning. We're getting ready to start our morning practice and we're about to go out on the water. It's an amazing experience to be able to wake up and see the sunrise over the marina. I think that that's one of the most gorgeous experiences that anyone can ever have. So coming here to Rao has been like a dream come true. Yeah, I agree with Marie. Uh, we get pretty lucky on how good the water conditions are here. Uh, I'm from Washington where, you know, you have like two months on the water that are really nice to row and the rest of the year, you know, you get soaking wet. It's a nice area because it's very protected from the wind and other elements. I love seeing like the sea lions and then every once in a while we get to see dolphins and they'll come up really close to our boats and it's so amazing. Except freshman year I thought they were sharks at first and I got really scared. but. But yeah, it's really nice just getting to see the different wildlife that can live here, even though it, you know it's a man-made area, but somehow they found their place here too. The seal jumped on one of the boys' boats. They were, as they were rowing it into the dock, he was just chilling there. I think that was just like a funny experience to just see, you know, kind of the interaction between like we're here all the time and then the interaction with the wildlife too. Lions on you! L-M-U! Lions! So, it sounds like the way the marina was designed makes it really easy for rowers because of the calm waters. Now, for those of us who like to sleep in, what can we do in the marina? What about fishing? My name's Keith Moray. I'm with Marina Del Rey Anglers. It's a local fishing club uh, composed of people like myself that love to fish. The fishing's actually really good. Uh, it's a great place to launch your boat from because you're close to a lot of the really good fishing areas so you don't have too far to travel. Summertime is when you catch the exotics. Those are the fish that most of the fishermen really want, like yellowtail, yellowfin tuna, dorado. They tend to travel with the warmer water, so summertime's better for them. But when the water gets colder, you can also catch lingcod, rock cod, uh, those kind of fish. They tend to go in deeper water. Um, but those are also, you know, highly sought after, really good to eat. So we have a project right here uh, where we raise white sea bass. It's funded by the Department of Fish and Wildlife and we get our hatchery fish from an operation in Carlsbad called Hub Sea World Research Institute. And we get little white sea bass, they're about three inches long. We raise them here in this pen, all stocked by volunteer help. It usually takes three to four months till they get to juvenile size, like about eight to 10 inches. And at that point we release them and they're old enough to forage for themselves and hopefully avoid the predators, the seals and the birds. And they grow to be 40, 50 pounds. 10 years ago, you hardly saw any of them. They were kind of rare. And since Hub SeaWorld started this program, you see the sport boat counts go way, way up. So it was pretty exciting to hear that, you know, one of our fish grew big and lived a long life and then somebody caught it. So there's good fishing? Hey, when I looked in the water, it was not that clear crystal blue like in all the movies. It looks pretty dark. How could it be good for fishing? When you can't see very deep into the water, it doesn't necessarily mean you've got a lot of mud in the water, because we have no rivers around here. Usually what it means here is two things. If it's right after a storm, right, we could have some sediment in the water, and it's making it very turbid. But if there's no storm or anything, what it means is you have a lot of biological activity. You've got microscopic plant cells, the phytoplankton, which are, are so productive that they're actually increasing how much light is scattered and you can't see that far down. Turbid is water movement, right? Exactly. So when the water flows out of the creek, some of it interacts with the marina. This is a water quality sonde. It measures temperature, salinity, oxygen, pH, other things. 
and we can lower this thing right through the water and get all these measurements as we go from all the way down to the bottom and back up. It sounds like a lot happens between the water quality and the animals. I could study the science of ecosystems my whole life and I'm not sure I'll understand it all. Some people, like Dr. Strauss and Dorsey, do just that. It is amazing to see how much this area has changed since the time they were just planning to build it. Yeah, I had no idea what it took to create and maintain a man-made marina. It also makes me wonder, what will Marina Del Rey look like for my kids?